Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hey, Yanis. Hey, Philip. So why should we listen to today's episode? Today, we'll talk with Alex about the following three topics. First, how to scale a RevOps organization using Unicorn Forto as an example. Second, how to set up, manage, and prioritize a RevOps roadmap. And because it's fun, how to do annual planning well. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to another episode of RevOps Lab. I'm here with Alex Müller, the founder of Revenue Enablement. Before this, uh, he you know, had short stints in banking and consulting, and then actually joined Forto, which now is a unicorn as the first RevOps person and scaled that to 12 people. We'll talk a lot more about this, you know, worked as the VP of RevOps at Cognigy and now started his own company that helps startups and scale-ups in, in software uh, on go-to-market and RevOps. So yeah, super excited to have you. Welcome, Alex. Hi, and thanks, Alex, for having me today. I'm very much looking forward to uh, the next 30 minutes. Awesome. So um I mean, not everybody's familiar with Forto. Can you maybe give a quick intro? What is Forto? And um, yeah, then let's dive deep into that experience. Sure. Um, so it's been actually a couple of years that uh, I initially joined Forto. was back in, in 2017. The company was uh, just founded um, about, well, six months before. And it was a very, very small startup back then based here in Berlin focused on delivering basically logistic services online to their customers. So shipping from China, for instance, over here to, to Europe, and really with the goal to challenge the big players like Kuhn and Nagel, like Schenker and all, and so on. By now, Forto is actually a little bit larger. Um, the last valuation was 2.1 billion, and uh, they're working approximately 900 people now. Awesome. So you basically run the helm of reforms, but I'm sure, you know, in an early stage startup, that meant a lot of things. So yeah, curious, like, you know, when you joined, what was your role? And then I'd love to go into, you know, how that team evolved through the different stages. I think that's super interesting to the, for the audience. Yeah, sure. So, you know, back then, I think it was uh, 2018 that we we first had this thought about establishing something for for revenue operations and um, i actually just read a, a linkedin post not not too long ago about companies basically stumbling into revenue operations especially when they are when they're growing they're not really planning hey we need this position right they think hey it's just extra headcount and of course we also had those thoughts in the beginning. So how it all started off was basically that uh, we implemented outreach back then in addition to, to Salesforce, the sales enablement solution or sales acceleration tool actually. And then after after a while, you know, the company kept on growing. And when we were round about a 100, 120 people, and I usually call this the time when things become complicated, you know, because there is the story of, of human organisms being or human um, systems being perfectly around 130 people. And then that's also when it starts to get a little bit complicated. You don't know any everyone anymore and so on. And especially as the CEO and, and uh, also the, the leaders on the, on the revenue side, you don't really know anymore who is actually doing what here, right? How are we reaching our targets? Who's actually managing all these systems and processes and whatsoever? So Michi Wax, uh, the, the CEO of, of Forto by now, he, he called me back then and um, said, Alex, so I have this idea. Here's what, uh, what we want to do. And, uh, we will call it revenue operations. And I was like, okay, very interesting. And to be, to be honest, I've never heard of this before. And I think in, <laughs> in Europe, this was also in, in 2017, still a name that wasn't really there, right? And I remember um, looking also on LinkedIn where, maybe, I don't know, I think, four or five people in Berlin with, with a similar title. And I said, yeah, actually it sounds interesting, like connecting all these dots on the, on the revenue org, connecting our, our sellers, connecting our systems, thinking of how could we develop that in, in the future, maybe even a little bit about strategy and stuff. And it just, just sounded appealing to me. And actually, I think this was probably one of the, of the best calls and best decisions in uh, my my professional life um, because uh, ever since then I, I really really enjoyed being on RevOps. I think 
Uh, one thing that I keep on saying, for me, it's the ultimate team sport. There's probably no other role in an org that's as much connected to other teams as revenue operations. And I think if I got it correctly, you also wanted to hear a little bit how, how we built up the, the org and how it changed through, throughout the time, right? Yeah, I think TeamSpot is a great point. So I'm super curious, right? Forto grew to 900 people. You being in that role that actually didn't exist back then in Europe. You know, how did your RefOps team develop over time, right? Like uh, in, in context of the stage of the company, maybe in context of the size of the revenue teams. Um, yeah, super curious uh, how, you, how you structured that. What kind of roles did you hire? Um, why? So we... Initially started with a team of around about 20 people on, on the commercial side um, back then, or you know, AEs and, and SDRs. And we actually focused really on operational topics. So we pretty early on brought in another person supporting all of our project management on the commercial side, ensuring that uh, things keep on keep on going. And uh, we actually somehow, I think... Um, also, luckily, looking back, managed that this was never really a, seen as a support function, but actually from the beginning, also the people that I was working with directly, our VP sales, the C-level, our VP growth, they all understood that this is more than in some other companies where RefOps tends to be like, can you help me schedule my call? Can you help me prepare my presentation or my contract, right? They actually saw in us the value of connecting all these dots. And in terms of, of hiring, we... I think had a we had something that is very typical for for many other companies that caused us to to hire in a certain way, and that was our CRM Salesforce. Uh, if we wouldn't have had Salesforce at that time already, I think our first hires would have looked maybe a little bit different. But because of that, we had uh, myself, we had another RefOps or SalesOps manager, and then we got in an engineer actually for for Salesforce pretty pretty early on. And uh, she was doing an, an amazing job. It was uh, really important for us that she understood the, the business processes uh, very early on. And we basically had everything on the commercial side built up in, in Salesforce, including, of course, our, our reporting as well. And I think we built actually quite a, a good structure around our, our CRM with, uh, with the help of, of our CRM developer. And eventually the, the person that we, we hired next was um, somebody who came internally from, from our sales teams. And she always felt a little bit like he wanted to do more. He doesn't, doesn't only want to do sales. He was interested in the the planning and the tools and that that on. And I think that's actually a really great hire and something that I still look out in, in all hires that I do for revenue operations that they have at some point uh, sold or seen a customer because that is just so helpful in the early days. And uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest recommendations that I can always give to uh, companies that are establishing RevOps try to look out for people who understand your product, who have maybe, if they haven't sold your own product, then at least worked uh, with customers in, in any type of area. And I think it's so important that uh, RevOps managers have this, this understanding, this feeling also for what customers want, what sellers need, what everyone on the, on the sales side or on the commercial side wants, right? And you can, I've, I've been talking a lot about sales because that's what we focused on in the beginning, but same for marketing ops, right? You want somebody who has done marketing before who has kind of suffered from not having somebody on operations. Yeah, I think there's a big trend from, you know, like especially CX, uh, so customer success people going into ref ops as they typically are very detail oriented and more technical. And I think that's a good skill set for revenue operations. I'm curious, the person you brought on from the sales side, right? Like what was the main responsibility for that person was that also going into enablement or yeah and then how did that org develop further into the 12 people you, you mentioned initially so actually yes um what you just mentioned enablement was one of the the first things that uh, that he was responsible for and um, more specifically we, we started with onboarding right so for us onboarding we wanted to scale at that time, and you can only really scale if you have a sound onboarding plan. 
And uh, for me, that's been something that's seen over and over in companies that they are maybe missing on, on somewhat a structured onboarding plan, but you you need it, especially when times are becoming difficult, when you're hiring a lot. But even if you're you're not hiring a lot, I've seen people being um, kicked out again because they weren't onboarded well. And that's probably the worst spend of your time, right? You hire somebody, it takes ages, you ramp this or you try to ramp this person up. And then after three or six months, you find out uh, we didn't we didn't really onboard them. We need to to kick them out again. And then, of course, also adjacent topics. So it was super helpful for us to have uh, this person giving us feedback on on sales processes, um, doing sales project management. And at that time, it was still such a small team that all of us had to do a little bit of everything: operations and enablement and analytics. And analytics for at that time was was more with me, um, reporting, board reporting, preparing our uh, numbers as well. And if I would probably do hire again for, for or build up a RevOps team again from scratch, I would probably start focusing on uh, operations first, setting up your, your structures, right? Don't, don't overcomplicate it. You don't need to have like an approval process for everything, but a sound operational structure will help you down the right down the line when you're growing. Second, look more into, into analytics, get your numbers at least those that you need to report on straight, right? And try not to build your own stuff, but rather use something that's commonly accepted because otherwise you will have problems later on again. And then third, and that's probably something that most companies should be doing rather sooner than later, try to bring in somebody specifically for onboarding or at least carve out, uh, sorry, for, for enablement or at least carve out some time of your, your RevOps team to also support training to support onboarding and you know i always compare this to to driving in a formula one car right you first you need to build it your operations then you need to know okay how quick are we actually are we good enough to to compete against the other teams out there you're measuring and your analytics right and then when you know hey in the second turn we are actually losing 2.1 seconds that's a lot right how can we make that better well Maybe just hit the the brake a little bit earlier, and then try to 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 accelerate when you're still in in the turn, right? And that's enablement for me. Using everything of what you've done before, knowing your numbers, showing it to your salespeople, training them on that, and basically by that improving your processes and really coming into into a great motion. Yeah, that's super insightful. Just on the on the onboarding part, curious like how you how you solve that because I think it's. You know, I think at, by this point in time, there are actually quite a few um, providers for onboarding tools specifically around sales. But um, I think like back in 2017, 2018, that was probably less so the case. Um, so how did you how did you do that? Did you build internal tools? Did you purchase software or just did it completely scrappy? Yeah. Yeah. So. Of course, it started with with an an Excel sheet, right? And so uh, or Google Sheets, how everything is starting, right? The cheapest CRM, the cheapest onboarding <laughs> plan, whatever you want to get. Uh, what fun thing to start and, with uh, uh, Excel? <laughs> they do, right? I mean, it's just so um, everyone knows how to use it. It's so easy to to use and to adjust. And actually, a, a he also read this morning in an article from from Tony Holbein about um, purchasing tools, and that resonated with me a lot. You first need the process before you buy something, right? You need to know where you want to go. And uh, I think, luckily, that's that's something that many teams understand now after um, a changes in the economy and the funding structure over the last years, right? You can't buy a tool for everything. But we eventually did. We then purchased a, a Berlin-based uh, tool where we were kind of included in co-development called Wonderway. And uh, we used Wonderway for, yeah, including videos, including best practices, checking if our, our sellers understood something. And we also used it actually for new product rollouts. And that's something where I would recommend most companies actually to also focus on, right? When you're changing, for instance, your ICP, when you're changing or when you're adding a new product, it's it's super important that you think of this enablement at this point again, and that's something that we had to learn, but something that we also at uh, Cognitive, for instance, did way earlier. There we hired a enablement person, and we kind of retrained a former seller into into our enablement person when we had 
roughly 150 people overall in the company. And he was the fourth person on, on, on the RevOps team then, or fifth person. Something like that. I mean, I think we could probably spend another uh, 30 minutes talking about onboarding, but I want to go deeper into the org structure. And I think it's super interesting. So you got the Salesforce engineer, right? You have the insights piece, the enablement piece. How big was the company back then? How many uh, people in the revenue team? And then how did that develop from there? So, I mean, one thing, unfortunately, that uh, I think is often the case for, for operations is that you're always running behind when it comes to, to hiring, right? And I, I was just attending a conference a couple of weeks back and I spoke to, to quite a lot of, of commercial leaders and there is actually a broad variety of when they start hiring for, for operations. And I think the latest was a company 250 people plus where they said, yeah, our, our CRM is still split across different teams. We don't really have a dedicated owner for it. They have, of course, all these uh, things, right? They have somebody also looking every now and then after sales processes, but they just have these problems with silos. They told me at this time, we are not we are not really connecting customer success with, uh, with sales, right? We are not connecting sales with marketing. The total opposite was company as small as 16 hires in, in total, and he said, yeah, of course I need an operation person. Um, this person can actually help me to, to make my customer-facing teams way more effective. As always, I think the truth is somewhere in between. So how did it change for us? I said, we built up the team at around about 130. We grew it to, to 12 when, when I left it at around about 800, 850 people. And we focused in the beginning, as I said, on, on those general lists, then uh, adding people for for data analytics for for sales anal analytics that that helped us really make the most out of our data and then we had uh, eventually as a one person for for enablement which is if you bring it inter uh, externally into the company probably still one of the most difficult hires for me and in terms of of structure i always try to have one poc for or customer facing teams. So that means even if you don't have a team of 12 people or of, of, of 30, um, I spoke actually to, to a customer not too long ago, I have 30 people in, in operations, then you can have at least a dedicated contact for your marketing team, a dedicated contact for your partnerships team, a dedicated contact for your SDR team, right? And so on and so forth. And that helps you ensure that um, also when it comes to planning, Nothing falls between the cracks, and you you do focus also on the different uh, different stakeholders, and uh, I think that's that's very very important. So I want to switch gears a bit. Like when you think about you know what you just said, how do you I mean how do you make sure that you organize your roadmap at a team with twelve people, manage all the day to day requests, you know the ops step, the larger topics that are strategic? How did you do that? So for me, it's always a first a question of leadership and then second also a question of um, functional knowledge right and when it comes to leadership just my personal belief i love working as a leader to leaders so that makes my my life easier i don't have to know everything i don't have to micromanage people out there and it also makes uh, work way more fun for for other people out there so our uh, typical cadence for for planning was was three months and and then also a year so for yearly outlook we basically prepared a, a roadmap where we said hey that's kind of what we want to tackle by when in the different different areas we always split that again by by operations by analytics by enablement and then depending um, on, on the setup, either by, by teams or by geography, if we had to localize something. And then it's super important that you start the discussion very, very early. So um, planning um, starts for me as um, basically connecting to your, your stakeholders, right? Before, for instance, the quarter um, starts or before the year starts, I would argue that at least six to, to eight weeks before. And yes, I know that sounds super early when it comes to, to annual planning, you need to, to reach out to the other teams, right? You need to understand what are they focusing on when it's quarterly planning. And then even, even then, I think six or four to six weeks is, is helpful that you 
that you speak to uh, other stakeholders. And if you now have this uh, point of contact for your marketing team, then I would request this person to to speak to the marketing lead and to align with them or him, him or her. Hey, what are actually your priorities for this next quarter, for the next year? And then we take all these things back. We try to, to group them. We try to prioritize them. What's their impact on our revenue? What's their impact on the way that we are working? And uh, with with these things in mind, then we we try to build out our our roadmap. Right? We try to understand what are dependencies and what do we see as the biggest lever, and we try to to rank them, kind of. And by that, try to to understand okay how how likely is it that we we can. Um, drive something forward. I think this, to be honest, is very typical to how product teams work. And uh, because you need to consider all the dependencies, right? You need to um, have, do a lot of stakeholder management, say no at times, uh, probably the most difficult part. And uh, yeah, find find your your way there for, for next year's strategy. Yeah, I think it's uh, so important that the stakeholders understand that a roadmap, there are always trade-offs. Right, you can't do everything at once and essentially drive alignment. I'm curious, like you had, you know, a specific example, right? Like uh, marketing, sales, and CS. Um, did you have one roadmap, and then just by categories, uh, or did you organize yourself, you know, in different roadmaps? And then how did you model the capacity against that, right? Like with regards to execution power, any insights there? So. Of course, if you already have an existing team, you can use something like Velocity, right? Then you know how um, quickly your team will be, especially when it comes to to CRM improvements. So that that in terms of, of capacity. But when you don't have that, then of course, it is sometimes a little bit of estimation. You need to look at other projects that are similar. Uh, you need to, to understand also from maybe other people who have done it before, have some invested or implemented something similar, how long would would something take but to, to come back to your question uh how we would organize that that roadmap it's basically for me a um a five-step process number one is you need to plan that's everything that we we just uh, discussed right get get the inputs from the stakeholders then second is you prepare you look at what can you actually deliver um and uh, how long will it take you third is you recommend so you speak again to your stakeholders, hey, this is how I understood the priorities, and shall we do it that way? You then lock it in, that's uh, the fourth part, and then fifth, you keep on tracking it. And that's for me where transparency is super important again, because you need to have this, this long list. And of course, as, as companies grow, you won't share everything with anyone anymore because it's just not digestible anymore. But for me, it was always super important to have the transparency in a long list where I could see, okay, are we on track? Why are we not on track? And if you do want to push in something new, um, what else can we maybe not do at the moment? And actually, that's something that my stakeholders always appreciated when I also shared that with them mid-quarter, for instance, right? Um, where you say, hey, it looks like this project is actually not going to uh, work out because we had these two other things coming in we had to prepare for i don't know um, a new product launch launch which was uh, happening earlier than planned or a change in in our environment whatsoever and i started doing that also uh, very simple just a, a, a overview in, in slides what are your priorities what are kind of the, the dimensions who are the, the stakeholders who are working on it is it marketing is it sales is it finance maybe even and then who is responsible on, on the ref side for um, solving that that part and coming from a product management background fully 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 understand and also there's of course like a lot of pain particularly around prioritizing things and then but yeah, like you said like stakeholder management ex managing expectations right um, and getting buy-in uh, is so crucial if you want your role to be successful long term in an organization mm. and on that note I was wondering, like, did your reporting structure change at any point, like, like, like um, with the RevOps um, team? So, uh, you know, did you report initially to more like the CEO, later to more like a CRO? Like, how did that develop over time? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Very, very interesting question. And uh, I think a question that also very much defines what, what the teams look like. So uh, for me, there are, there are three potential um, reporting lines. Number one is you report to a functional lead within uh, the commercial org. Most often that happens to be the sales leader, or VP sales. Second is you report to the CEO when the company is larger than to the CRO. And third, you report to the CFO. And all of, of these areas, they have, uh, of course, a lot of uh, pros and cons. And we started off similar reporting back then to our, our VP growth, um, who was also responsible for, for part of the, of the sales strategy. And uh, then very quickly at Forto switched to, to the CRO. And actually for the last four years, I think I've only reported to, to C-level directly. And um, so I've seen now uh, myself reporting to CEO, reporting to CRO, reporting to CFO. At one point, we also switched it at Cognitive uh, to to the CFO. And I think why it shouldn't be with with sales only that has been often discussed, right? For pure focus on sales, not focusing on other teams. Uh, being with the CEO or CRO, I think really makes sense because you uh, have then this holistic view over the overall revenue engine you can also drive projects forward end to end and then there there is a cfo and that has also something um, very remarkable uh, remarkable for me because for me it's the only way that RevOps can truly stay neutral to to the revenue function and the downside is that there is a tendency that you're becoming more the reporting team than uh, than actually also doing the operations end to end. You're maybe missing um, connection to to the sales teams. But I would advocate that either you you report to the CRO, CEO, or to to the CFO. I think that that makes most sense. That's most typical. Also, what what I see and uh, something that um, works out pretty well, at least for me. Yeah, fantastic. I think that's such an interesting topic. We should probably spend another episode on that one i want to switch gears again i mean you touched on planning cycles right i think a lot of companies are in annual planning mode right now q4 always fun short and a lot of stuff going on so yeah i'm curious you know what's your approach to annual planning i mean i know it, it needs to start super early right but uh from a ref perspective you know from a general company perspective how do you uh, you know how do you approach that uh, what are your views on that yeah so annual planning, I think, is, is kind of the, the necessary evil, right, that we, we all have to, to go through at some point. And knowing that uh, there are probably companies out there who just started with annual planning, like in, in terms of they haven't done it before, and uh, companies where they have already a very, very rigorous process around, around planning, um, there are so many facets of it. And I think one thing that's very common is uh, that in terms of, of timeline, you cannot start too early with a V1, right? And that often starts with uh, either the business plan or the budget received from, from finance. And the way I see this is finance with the budget is basically telling you, hey, this is where we want to be, right? That's kind of the the peak of the of the mountain and we want to go there how do we get there we don't know right we can maybe make some assumptions we could say hey that's some revenue should come from uh, enterprise some should come from mid-market some should come from from small customers if, if that's your split or maybe also different geographies but for me that's always a little bit like well building castles in the sky and i think it's actually it, it can be a very interesting exercise for for ref ops to um get or to become also part of, of annual planning so if you're not part of it and you're driving ref ops then this is actually a very good way for you to show your importance and there are there are two reasons namely for it number one is annual planning and uh, setting targets and everything really define success for the company right so it's uh, such a crucial exercise to to define where the focus should be for for the next year and um, by by defining that you can use your your own knowledge from the crowd stuff from whatever you've seen in, in the past and uh, number two is you as ref ops are probably that team that is the closest both to finance and 
to your, your customer facing teams, to your revenue generating teams. And connecting these two dots, really the, what I say, the, the finance world, the model world with the real world out there, with uh, what customers are actually doing. I think that's a unique ability that the RefOps team has. And uh, if you do this correctly, then you really can leverage yourself. You can step up to be a actually strategic counterpart for uh, for your finance team and uh, become really strategic RefOps, show relevance to the overall company and especially pull out of that corner where you're often seen as pure system admins or pure support teams, right? And really become an, an important important part of, of the well overall company management. Yeah, I, I have a love and hate experience with uh, annual planning. I think that most companies start the annual planning process way too late, right? They start in Q4, uh, then have initial board discussions between CEO, CFO, and the board, and then present the revenue team with a plan. I think that is a fundamentally broken process. It should be a joint plan, right? It should be, you know, a bottom-up and top-down plan together. Uh, because, it, like, it, it's great if you build a castle in the sky, but it's just not realistic, right? And and so um, I I fully subscribe to what you're saying with regards to RefOps. It's it's a you know it's a, another way of being strategic. Um, and typically, I think there's a big uh, motion on the CFO side to be go to market CFOs more like to become more strategic also from a revenue generation standpoint and I think that's a great movement especially in, in software but you know I think it's like really really fundamentally important to combine those efforts you know start in Q3 uh, combine those efforts have a general you know committee of doing that FPNA and RefOps together and then uh, come to the board and the CEO uh, with something that is aligned, bottom up and top down, and uh, and then yields higher likelihood of, of success. Because I think the ripple effects of this are also massive, right? If if you as a revenue team always are behind goals, the whole commission structure is problematic. I mean, there are so many ripple effects on the equity value. So uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a really really good point you're making here, and I really love the the strategic dimension of uh, you know RefOps that you know can play, that that refops can play here no? yeah i think one thing that i just want to mention that's often overlooked right so if you just touch it briefly but the effects of annual planning down the line they are so enormous and they um will just make it also difficult for for refops if they are not participating in this discussion from the beginning and i'm speaking of things like territory planning compensation planning go to market strategy right all that depends on on how you do your planning, how you combine a top down and a bottom up view, and uh, yeah, you can uh, set yourself in a, in a very unique position by following uh, or being part of this discussion early on. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's a great point. I mean, I think you know my my takeaway from that is like that's one angle, you know, to be more strategic, uh, you know, as a as a revenue operations leader. I think the second you actually touched is the org design, right? Like being in the executive suite, you know, making sure that you have an end-to-end -end view on all things go to market from marketing sales to CS, right? That all plays a role and 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 actually having strategic initiatives, whether that's going up market, you know, internationalization, right? Like fundamentals that are completely changing the, tra 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 the trajectory of, of companies. Um, so yeah, I really love all your views i want i want you to come back to this i think we have a lot of more topics we can discuss here but uh thank you so much for for sharing this i would love to ask you one final closing question we ask all our guests and that's you now if you were to start out in refops again you know what would you tell your younger self what are the key learnings you've had so far so i think the one single and there are probably a few things right but there's one single thing that that i could recommend and that's Look out for a mentor, right? And that's it. Your your boss who has been in, in RefOps, who is somewhat having this the strategic holistic view, be it somebody on LinkedIn that you maybe just message and who who every now and then, every maybe once a month, every two weeks, whatsoever, spends some time with you discussing your your views, your roadmap with you, maybe. And uh, there are also professional services out there that offer often that right now for for RefOps. And I think that 
really helps you to build up a team quicker, to not dwell on, on your thoughts for, for too long, to rather learn from, from a community around you. And uh, that's, that's something that I would definitely recommend everyone starting in, in RevOps again. And then look for, for a community, look for a mentor for you. And uh, then I think you will have a very, very interesting time. You will have an amazing job and uh, it will never really get boring. Sometimes also, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think particularly for, for roles like, uh, you know, RevOps, similar product management also, like you, you never have like a huge org um, in your company. So it's always good to have uh, mentors like that are inside the company. Um, just to put you on the map also, um, because sometimes it's actually, it's, it's, not, it's not so easy, particularly if your own team is, is quite small. Uh, so I just want to just wanna double down on that. I think it's like really one of the most important career advices uh, you can get. Yeah. Alex. Great. Awesome. I think uh, this was fantastic. Love the level of detail. And yeah, I hope we can have you back one day. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Great to have you. Janis, Philip, thank you so much as well. It was uh, really a pleasure. I'm very, very much looking forward to our next discussion. <laughs> thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweetflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you.